Well, it is absolutely wonderful to be back. I want to thank you for receiving Pam and me so well and the other missionaries. We've been housed with the Macon family. I want to thank them for their hospitality for the past five or six days. And the other missionaries also have been in homes of members of the church. So thank you for that. And you sure fed us well. Thank God for that. I'm, you know, I'm absolutely certain that this church will be in charge of food in heaven too. You know, it'll be great. We always had that as a traditional part of, of the uh, life of this church ever since I started attending here. Wednesday night we talked about uh, missions as uh, generosity, um, turning our no into a yes. We all have these barriers inside of us where we, we see certain situations and our normal response is to say no, I'm not going to get involved with that. Uh, I, don't, I think that person deserves it. We'll just leave them like they are. But when God begins to work in your life, he, be, he little by little uh, turns all of your no's into yes. Because all the promises of God in Jesus are yes. yes. And as we're becoming closer to God, he begins to work in our hearts. I, I remember um, I did not ever want to be a missionary. It took God years and years and years to turn that no into a yes. And then when I got to the mission field, there were certain kind of people I didn't want to try to help because they made me a little bit afraid. And little by little, God has turned those no's into yes. And I think the idea of being sanctified or growing in faith is little by little, God takes away your fear. The Bible says, perfect love cast out fear. And we're all afraid of something. And I know some of you are thinking of the idea of missions. Uh, you might be a little afraid of some of that. All of us who started out in this direction have had to overcome our fears. And, and a part of being a disciple of Jesus is to let God begin to expel out of you uh, your fears. Fears about your own past, fears about your present, fears about your future. And it's a, it's a process you just have to go through. And a part of that process is a missions conference where you get to see new things and hear new things and some of it may, may not be all that interesting to you but it is a part of what God is doing in all of our lives. But this morning I wanna talk about missions is presence. Can you say the word presence with me? Presence, one more time, presence. There's no such thing as doing missions without somebody be willing, being willing to be the presence of Jesus in a place where Jesus is not yet present. I don't know if you really understand completely. I certainly lived many years before I really understood the truth that Paul says in Colossians, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Can you repeat that with me? Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of God appeared in this world on a lot of different occasions in the Old Testament, but the glory of God appeared most clearly and perfectly when God became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, full of grace and truth. It was when Jesus became present in this world that we actually got a clear picture of the Father. Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. And right now in you there dwells the glory and the presence of God, Christ in you. And we don't understand how significant that is, but literally we are the presence of God in this world, each and every believer. And each and every believer is supposed to be a, a new presentation of God in the world in the sense that we are to present to the world a picture of the characteristics of God. The church is called the body of Christ. And we are supposed to be his hands, his feet, his, his eyes, his voice, his presence. And so missions is about a presence. 
Uh, this church has been here on this corner for a long time, 60 years since it began over near Johnson Street in a rented building and uh, came to this property and it's grown and grown and grown. But if you want to, want, to know, want to know what the real story of this church is, it's the presence of Jesus in people here. And missions is nothing more than God inspiring someone to move their physical presence to a different place, many times to a different country, to a different person, uh, to a different people, and be the presence of God. Many of us have a wrong idea about what Jesus did when he was in the world. We think that Jesus came to the world, lived for 33 years, died on the cross, was buried, rose from the dead, and then he left. But that's not what he did. What he did was change the way he is present. When he first came, he could only be physically present with a very small group of disciples. So his beginning discipleship method was his presence with a very few people. And as his presence was felt and as his presence changed lives, and as his presence showed people what the Father was like, incredible miracles happened, incredible powerful things happened, lives were changed. But he warned his disciples on the last day that he was with them that he was going to leave. But in order to com comfort them, he said, but don't let your heart be troubled because my Father and the Spirit and I, we will come and we will make our home in you. And then he told them to go and make disciples and baptize people among all the nations in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he gave this promise and he said, and I will be with you until the end of the age. So a lot of Christians think Jesus left and is no longer at work like he was. No, that's not true. That's why he told his first disciples, you wait in Jerusalem until the power of the Holy Spirit comes over you. Because if they had tried to do this thing called evangelism or missions without the presence of Jesus, it would have been a colossal failure. But he didn't come back physically. He came back in, his, in the spirit, the spirit of Christ. And that spirit that came at Pentecost abides in you right now. And that spirit is literally the essence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And the reason that spirit is within you is so that you can continue to be the presence of Jesus Christ. That's why if you have just one or two or three people, two or three people gathered, he is there present. So the church might have three people, or the church might have 3,000 people, or the church might have 30,000 people, but it's only one presence. And that's the great secret of Christianity. The great secret of Christianity is every single believer has exactly the same amount of Jesus that every other believer has. We are one in Christ. And so when you understand that you have the presence of Christ, then you can look at me and see me as your brother. And I can look at you and see you as my family. And I can see you and I together being the presence of God. And that's God's plan for missions. And every now and then he touches certain couples like he did Pastor Brian and Vicky, and sent them to Mexico. And now he's brought him here. But the same presence that they were in Mexico is the same presence that they will be here. It is literally the presence of Jesus that we are in the world. He, he described it like this, you will be salt, you will be light, rivers of living water will flow from you if you believe in me. You will bear much fruit in John 15 and you will be my disciples. And the key to understanding this whole concept 
is to really remember this word, presence. Can you say it one more time with me, this word? Presence. Presence. Have you ever been around somebody who has presence? Have you ever been around somebody that no matter, they walk into a room and it's like every eye turns in the direction of this person? They, and we say, that person has presence. And we pay attention to those kind of people. They have presence. There's something about them, the way they carry themselves, the way they look at you, and you feel that. Every single disciple of Jesus has the presence of Jesus. And if you will learn to abide in that presence and let that presence be literally what defines you, what inspires you, what allows you to be free of your fear, you will begin to attract an attention not to you, but to the person of Jesus. And when a whole community of believers gathers this presence, people begin to come and they want to know, what is it? And we would say to them, it's the presence. It's the presence of Jesus. And where the presence of Jesus is very, very strong, God is free to change thousands and thousands of lives. And so all of us should be willing to be missionaries of this presence. And we need to wake up in the morning and affirm and know that we carry this presence. I have a habit that I've developed over the last 10 years When I awaken in the morning, I don't always do this physically, and I don't always do this verbally, but I will place my hand over my heart, either in my mind or or physically, and I will say, Jesus, you are welcome here. Can you say that with me? Jesus, you are welcome here. And then I go on and I say, the entire Christian life that I will ever live already abides in me. For to me to live is Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Christ is all and is in all. Would you say those words with me? Would you start, put your hand over your heart and just say these words with me and say, Jesus, you are welcome here. The entire Christian life that I will ever live already abides in me. For to me to live is Christ. It is no longer I who live. It is Christ who lives in me. Christ is all and is in all. Amen. What do you feel? The presence. And if you start your day every day understanding that I don't have more of the presence than you do, and you don't have more of the presence than I do, but we have the presence of God in our lives, amen? And if we begin that way every day, and then throughout the day you affirm the presence. I I know people who have little habits to help them to remember the presence. Some people put their iPhone or their smartphone And every hour it beeps, and they remember the presence because the phone beeps. I know one person who every time they touch a doorknob, every time they touch a doorknob, they think, Jesus abides in me. Just something that says, I'm in the presence, and the presence is in me. It's a tremendously powerful understanding that we have. But I want to, this morning, very quickly, just look at one moment in the life of Jesus where his presence made a difference. But if you look at his whole life while he was here in the Gospels, when you read in the Gospels, it was his presence that made the difference. And that presence did not leave this world. That presence, by the Spirit of God that's in you, the Spirit of Christ, is right here today. It's the same presence It's the presence of Christ. And we live and move and have our being in this presence, the presence of Jesus Christ. If you have your Bible and you'd like to follow along in Mark chapter 7, 
verses 31 to 37, uh, we find these words. Uh, It's really interesting. Just the very first word, it says, again, again. Somebody said something about life. The problem with life is it's so daily. It is again and again and again and again and again and again. But when you understand that you are living and moving and walking and living the presence of Christ, this word again is an opportunity. It's not a negative. It's again, again, another opportunity, another day, another moment that I can be the presence of Christ. It says, again, departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the region of the Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. Then they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to put his hand on him. And he took him aside. Jesus takes this man aside by himself from the multitude, and he put his fingers in his ears. And he, Jesus, spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephaphtha, that is, be opened. Immediately his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke plainly. Then he commanded them that they should tell no one, but the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. I love this story because uh, it shows the power of the simplicity of Jesus' plan of helping people. Sometimes we think that the plan to help people requires great intelligence or great ability. No, it requires presence. Some of the most powerful people I know in Brazil are about this tall, female, and illiterate. the little Dona Marias of Latin America who changed the world because they live the presence of Jesus. I cannot tell you the number of times that I have seen wealthy Brazilians come to Christ because of the maid. I cannot tell you the number of times where I've seen the strong receive Christ because of the presence of Jesus in the week. It happens all the time because the presence is the power. It's not the intelligence. It's not the physical stature. It is the presence of Jesus. And this story shows this presence in in an interesting way. To be the presence of Jesus in the world, we have to get up every day again and again and again and go. Go into all the world. Go. That means you have to look at your life not as a task. You have to look at your life as a presence. Salt, light, fruit. I know that some of you think, I'll be happy if I could live somewhere else. No, you live inside of you. If you can be happy inside of you, you can be happy anywhere. You say, oh, I don't want to live outside the U.S. I don't want to live live in South Florida. I don't want to live in Hollywood. Your problem is not Hollywood. Your problem is not South Florida. Your problem is not the United States. You have to learn to be happy in the presence of God inside of you. And then you just have to say to him, wherever you want to move me, I know you're going with me, so I'll go. And so every day, I mean, you can learn to even abide in Jesus while you're trying to get through the crazy line getting your driver's license renewed. If you can be happy there, you can be happy anywhere. You can even be abiding on I-95. I'm having a hard time with that, but it can be done. You may not like to fly. I don't like to fly, but I can be in the presence of Jesus and fly without fear, which is an amazing miracle to me that that's even possible. It's an ongoing presence. It's a normal way of living. And we as Christians need to regather the idea and remember the idea, we are pilgrims, we're on a journey. This is not about getting to a destination here, it's about being the presence of God here. And then someday living in the presence of God eternally and as the presence of God. And there's, but it's also a comprehending presence. 
You know, as you begin to grow in Christ and you begin to understand the scriptures and you begin to understand what God is doing, you begin to understand people and you begin to, rather than see all the differences, you really begin to understand people are just people. And you begin to understand what their real needs are. And Jesus saw this man and he understood his need. Now this man had some very evident needs. He was deaf. He was tongue-tied. And he was unable to speak. Those are big, big challenges in any culture at any time. But in the time of Jesus, to be deaf, to be tongue-tied, and unable to speak, the attitude was basically he deserves what he's got. He's offended God in some way, and you, you, you have these problems because you, you had a problem and you, did, you sinned against God, and this kind of a person, just like in the video a few minutes ago we saw from, the, from Mike uh, in Africa, where a, a physical defect can be a death sentence. That's the kind of world Jesus was living in. Now, Jesus could have made this man a public spectacle. He could have said, wow, what a great opportunity to build my crowd. I'm going to cure him, and then I'm going to take an offering. Thank God Jesus is not like those people. He takes him aside. Why does he take him aside? Because this guy's entire life has been a public spectacle. Every day of his life, this poor man has lived as people noticing him because of his difference, his defect. People who have the presence of Jesus do not make people's defects a public spectacle. We take them aside and we get them alone and we try to communicate to them that everybody has problems and everybody needs the presence of God. We don't make every single person troop down to the front of the auditorium so we can get some power out of their weakness. We we work with them as long as we need to in private to help them. And Jesus did this with this man. He gave him individual attention and he gave him individual treatment. Now I want you to get this picture Here is the Holy Son of God, the presence of God made manifest, full of grace and truth. And he gets right up face to face with a man who I promise you doesn't smell well, is drooling, who is not what everybody would think would be the kind of person that you should give that much attention to. And he gets right up on him and he puts his fingers in his ears. Now, can you get this picture? You've got to get close to do this. I mean, if you're going to put your fingers in somebody's ear, how close do you have to be? You are eye to eye, and he puts his fingers in his ear. What's he saying to the guy? I get it. I know your problem, but I'm not afraid of your problem. I will touch your problem. And then he spits. Now, how many preachers do you know that go around spitting? as a part of their normal process of blessing people. I mean, it's not exactly a pretty thought, but he spits. You go, what in the world is he spitting for? Because if you're tongue-tied, that literally means that he couldn't even make his tongue work correctly, and so he would be drooling. So his whole life, he's drooling. He can't hear what people are saying, and Jesus spits to say, I get it. I understand your frustration. I know what you're feeling And then he touches his tongue. You know, when you get that close to a person where you are putting your fingers in their ears, you're spitting like they're spitting, and you are touching their tongue, you see the growing confidence between Jesus and this guy? Can you kind of picture the guy scared to death? Jesus has got him all alone. Why? Because the way Jesus works with us, all of us, is very individual And it's all based on how close can he get to you and how close will you let him get to you. And a church should be a place where we say to people, we're not perfect, 
but we want you to get close to us, and if you'll lean into us, we will say to you, I get it. I, I also have weaknesses. And he touched his tongue. You know, it's really interesting that the tip of the tongue is one of the most sensitive places on the human body. The tip of the finger is very sensitive, but the tip of the tongue is even more sensitive. And so Jesus is touching him right, right where he's at. Then Jesus does this. He sighs. Why did he sigh? Because a sigh even a deaf man can hear. Because when you sigh, you do it with your body. You go, <sighs> and so Jesus is saying to him, I understand you can't hear. I understand that you can't even control your tongue. I understand your pain, and I know how tired you are of this mess. And he sighs with him to say, I also am tired of this for you. He's literally weeping with him. And then he does this. He looks up to heaven. Why does he look up to heaven? Because when you look up to heaven, you say, God is going to do this, not me. And Jesus would later say, all the works that I did, I didn't do them. My father did them. You know what? That's what we need to be saying. I didn't do anything. God did. And so he touches his ears. He touches his tongue. He spits. He touches his tongue. He sighs. He looks up to heaven. And then the guy can't hear this yet. But he says, Ephaphtra, being be opened. And he cures this man. And then he tells everybody, don't talk about this. I don't even know sometimes why Jesus did that because it's like when you tell human beings don't do something, that's exactly what they're going to do. So today, don't talk about this sermon, okay? No, you're not allowed. Maybe it'll last past lunch. I don't know. So, so what is Jesus showing us? And what is he showing his disciples? He's saying this, look, I am not, I'm going away physically. Because if I stay here physically, we can only have a church where people can touch Jesus that goes to about 120 people. If Jesus had stayed here physically, biologically, how big would the Christian church be able to be and get this close to Jesus? It'd be about 120 people. But if Jesus is in all of us, how big and how far can Jesus travel? We can go everywhere. It's a perfect plan because of the presence of Jesus. You know, when I think about the church, I was kind of trained to think about the church, about how many do we have on Sunday? And now I don't think about the church like that anymore. I like to think of the church like this. After we all leave here, we are going to spread out from here, right? And if we are all tuned to the presence of Jesus in us, we're going to go out there and we're going to be a presence that the world cannot ignore. You come here to celebrate what's going on out there. If you only come here to celebrate what's going on in here, you don't understand the presence of God. God doesn't live in buildings anymore. He lives in you. You are the presence of Jesus. The Bible says it clearly. Do you not understand that you are the sanctuary of God? Do you not understand that everywhere you walk, everywhere you go, you are the presence of Jesus? Now you need to understand this. You can do nothing. Jesus said, without me, you can do. So you, every day you have to submit to the fact 
that you can do nothing. I have a little thing that I do every day with myself. I say, um, I can't, he can't, he can. I don't know, but he knows. I am not, but he is. Why do I do that? It's because I want to be his presence. I don't want to be my presence. My presence will get absolutely nothing of spiritual value done, but Christ in me, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So what is missions? And what are we asking of you during this week? We're asking of you simply to be what you are. We're not asking you to be something different. We're saying, just be what you are. You are the presence of Jesus wherever you are if you abide in him. And ask God to make you sensitive enough to people's needs that Jesus can put you right up against a deaf, tongue-tied, rejected life and that person would trust you enough that they would let you put your fingers on their weakness and take away your pride to the place where you don't have any embarrassment about spitting and you identify with them so much that you would sigh And then don't forget to look up to heaven and know you can't do anything. But from heaven there can come the words, for this person in front of you, be open. And through your life, people can have the presence of God enter their life and open their hearts to the glory of God and we will spend eternity together glorifying God with them. Don't you want to be a part of that? Don't you really want to be a part of that? I don't care if I'm in the pulpit. I don't care if I have the name pastor. What I want now at this phase of my life is to just be the presence. And I want to be a part of a church where people are concerned about just being the presence of God. I believe that's what your pastor wants and the leadership of this church wants. And I believe that Hollywood, Florida and the surrounding areas doesn't need a big church. It needs a church that is the presence of Jesus and then God will grow it to whatever that presence needs to be. Amen? Amen. So would you pray for me? (laughs) Would you pray for the McCords? Pray for the other missionaries? You know, some of them labor in places where they're never going to see big results. But that isn't, it's like the song that that, that, uh, Mike put up there. Love is worth the fight. Being the presence is worth the fight. It doesn't matter whether it's two or three or whether it's two or three thousand. We just have to be the presence of Jesus where we're at. I am so excited for you because I see the presence of Jesus in you. I feel the presence of Jesus in you. You have turned my head by your presence. And I pray that God will multiply his presence in you and through you to win many, many people to Jesus in this place. And if you've not received Jesus as your Savior, you have to ask him to come in on October 22nd, 1967, in what is now the cafeteria, I was 16 years old, and I received the presence of Jesus in my life. I shudder to think where I would be today without his presence in my life. If you've never received him, open your heart and receive the presence today. Because when you receive the presence, 
Nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in the presence of Christ, which is in you. May God bless you, and may you touch the world by your presence. Thank you.